Well, y'all, talk about mess. <laughs> Today is Monday, um, Monday, what is it, February 22nd, 2020. And a week ago today, I mean, I live just outside of Houston, okay? Now, I was, I'm from Arkansas, grew up and raised in Arkansas area, moved down to Houston back around 2007 time frame or so, sometime in there. But uh, I live outside of Houston now, and we got a lot of snow and ice uh, about a week ago. I'm sure y'all have probably seen some of it on the news and whatnot and everything else that was happening down here. It was crazy, to, to put it simply. You know, some, uh, you know, kind of scary things happen. Now, you know, we've been without power before. You know, the the, the just the fact that the electricity went out for here where I live, we lost power for about, I don't know, 14 or 18 hours or so on two or three different days. The power would come back on for 10 or 12 hours and go back out again. But what is scary about it is the fact that the Texas power grid is managed by this company called, well, it's not a company, it's an organization or whatever called ERCOT. Basically, and I'm not an expert on it by any means, but from my understanding, from this hillbilly's understanding, Texas has, produces all of their own power in state. They don't bring any power in from across other state lines. Very limited, so if they do, very limited factory uh, a percentage of it. <clears throat> so what happened, in short, Texas opted to do this so they were not federally regulated, whatever that means. I, I think they did this back, uh, gosh, I don't know, back in the late 90s or something. I, I don't know for sure. something I, I read online. Anyway, when Texas was having issues, that was why we have issues. You know, when when they had this big ice storm and snowstorm come in, they started having problems with generators going down, uh, windmills. Of course, Governor Abbott blamed it on windmills, but they only account for like less than 10% of the power in Texas. Anyway, long story short, it was a huge screw up and a big mess and people died from it. <clears throat> people died from it. Now, the scary thing is, you know, not having power is, you know, that, that sucks, you know, but, you know, it's not, it's not something that you're, that I'm exceedingly worried about, except in this situation, which brings me to mind, the scary thing is, they said that we were minutes away from having a total grid meltdown of some sort in Texas. That's why they had to start uh, pulling switches and turning off power, because if they didn't, our grid would have been destroyed in a lot of the capacity and a lot of Texas or the majority of Texas would have been without power for months, plural, M-O-N-T-H-S, months. Can you imagine how what that would have been like? Now, I'm sure they would have done something, brought in power across straight lines or whatever to keep essential services running, but I mean, think about it. I mean, really, that's about as, as close to a, an EMP type situation as you can get. Um, no power. Think about it. No gas at the gas stations. No food at the grocery stores. You know, Texas would have a huge migration of people leaving it if that happened. You know, thank gosh, you know, we got the property up in Arkansas we could go to. But anyway... Yeah, it was a mess. It was a mess. Now, I you know, I know y'all up north, uh, you, you guys deal with these types of storms like that all the time. I know there's a lot of people around the country that were without power a hell of a lot longer than, you know, 12 or 18 hours or wherever how long we were out. Rob, if you're watching this, I know you, I think y'all said you were down for over 30 plus hours. But anyway, yeah, I mean, and when you get uh, a state where the vast majority of he heating for the houses in the state of Texas is electric. Now, now we have gas because we're in the Houston area, but a lot of the more rural people stuff, they heat their houses solely by electric. And when you take away their electric, you ain't got no heat. And that's the problem. You know, a lot of times people have backup heat in other places like wood stoves, pellet stoves, oil heat, and things like that up north. But yeah, it was, anyway, it, it was a mess. It, it was a big mess. So what have we learned from this? Well, y'all know that I've always been somewhat of um, a half-ass, excuse my language, I don't know if I can say that, half-ass prepper of some sort. So, 
you know, with COVID happening last year and this little incident with the ice storm, uh, preppers rejoice, folks. My wife of over 20 years is finally seeing the <laughs> advantages, you know, the stuff where she used to roll her eyes on when I say, hey, you know, I'm going to buy a few more cases of water to keep around or I'm buying Sorry, this or I'm buying that. What you said. Sorry, my watch is smarter than me sometimes trying to talk to me. But anyway, I'm fi she's finally seeing the justification from this. And my, I mean, my wife is coming to me and saying, hey, you know what? We really should get uh, this second generator I was looking at, or we really, we really should get, you know, some more MREs or uh, cases of water to keep around, stuff like that. <clears throat> it makes sense. I mean, this, this, just, just this little incident shows you kind of how fragile our infrastructure is here in the States. And that's something, if uh, if you guys have read any of the, the prepper fictional stories and stuff like that, that's something they attacked in some of those stories, you know, is go after the power grid. Because if you, you take down the power grid, imagine, you know, how many, how, how far back we'd roll the clock here in the States and try to survive. It would be chaos. If y'all have never read it, check out, and this is, this is a good fictional story. It's called Lights Out. <clears throat> and back in the day, a guy posted it, I think it was on Frugal Squirrels, which is uh, like a prepper's forum. Uh, I'm, I'm a, been a long-time member of it. But it's an interesting read, and it's not, I'll be the first to tell you, it's not very well written. The guy who wrote it was just an amateur. He was writing this, and he would post section, sections of it on the, um, um, on the forums as he completed it. But somewhere out there, there's a PDF compilation of his book. Now... And I can't remember his name, but I will post it right down here. It's called Lights Out, and this is the guy who wrote it. But it's basically a story that centers around <clears throat> a suburb of San Antonio, and then there's an EMP, and it's about what happens in the subsequent months with no electricity pulled in the States. Now do this if you read it. It is available on Amazon. You can buy it in a Kindle version. Uh, like an ebook version. It's not very expensive. It's less than 10 bucks. But if you can buy that to support the author of it, okay? But if you can find the original unedited version, which there used to be a PDF running around out there somewhere of it, read that instead. Because the edited version that's on Amazon, they kind of cleaned up some of the uh, the writing on it and so forth. But they took out a lot of the details that interest us, us preppers, you know, instead of Instead of like in the original version, he says, well, you know, uh, we, we picked up a Glock 17 for my daughter, Samantha, to carry. In the, in the edited version on Amazon, it's like, well, we picked up an extra handgun for our daughter to carry. Things like that. I don't, I don't know why they did that. But anyway, I guess whoever saw it to be that they published it did something along the lines of that. But anyway, <clears throat> interesting read. But I tell you that to tell you this. This is a good opportunity to, to, to sit back and see what happened and kind of, kind of make some preparations at home. I've got a little, just a little 2,000 watt inverter generator. Well, it's actually like 1,600 running 2,000 watt output. And let me tell you, that thing saved the day uh, this time around. Um, you can get those for uh, $399 at Sam's, an AI power version. There's a lot of them out there between 400 to 500 bucks, and they're all pretty much the same. Now, I opted for the one that was like 499 from Costco that has a Yamaha motor in it. And actually, a few days ago, I ordered a second one. The thought process being I can parallel those two together and get 3,200 running watts versus 1,600 and then run a lot more stuff with it. My other point of reasoning behind having two of them was if one breaks down, I always have one generator to carry us through. But our house was a mess during this electric down because, you know, I would run the generator outside the whole time the power was down, have extension cords running one to the freezer, one to the fridge. The fish tank always had to be plugged in, things like that. <coughs> now, I will say... With that 1600 watt one and the extension cord I had running to the freezer, the freezer was not starting as well as it should. I don't think it was starting the compressor. I hope I didn't screw it up, actually, but it seems to be running fine now that the power is back on. But that freezer, we had to repair it just when COVID started, 
and they put a heck of a compressor setup in it. And I guess that thing must draw a lot of watts starting out. So I'm hoping when I get this new one parallel and together, it should start at no problem. Have a generator on hand is what I'm getting at because they're very handy to have. The inverter ones, your neighbors will thank you because they're a lot quieter. Plus you can plug in sensitive electronics because they have a lot cleaner sine wave. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat. Have gas on hand, another biggie. I keep, I generally have around between 20 and 25 gallons of gas on hand at all times. Um, I like to use the Eagle brand gas cans. You can get them on Amazon, generally about 30 bucks. You can buy them at TC, TSC, different places like that as well. Check the Amazon. Amazon's not always cheapest on those. Sometimes you can get them cheaper at TSC and sometimes Amazon has them cheaper. But I like the heavy metal gas cans and um, I will buy gas for those once a year. And I always get ethanol free gas, which you have to, I have to drive up to the local Bucky's to get the ethanol free gas. And then I add some of the Startron blue enzyme treatment to it. I'll post in a picture of the Eagle gas cans here. Let you guys look at it for a second. Then here's the Startron fuel treatment here. Um, and generally, like I said, I, I try to swap out that gas at least once a year in those. And what I do is when the year is coming up, like at the 10 month mark, I'll let my truck run empty and I fill up my truck from those gas cans. And then the very same day, I'll drive and refill them at Bucky's. So, um, <clears throat> so Bo decided to interrupt me. He likes to sit up here in this window in my den, looking out over the cul-de-sac in the neighborhood. And then he lets me know whenever someone decides to, God forbid, open their door or go walking down the street with someone. Gotta love him. Baby Bo. Bo Randall. What are you doing? All right, so sorry about that. Had a dog distraction. Uh, I think he's quieted down somewhat. But have gas for your generator, have a generator. That's the two pieces of advice I can give you for a power adage. Another thing is have a lot of water on hand in your house and have a lot of non-perishable food on hand. I'm not saying you have to go out and spend all these big bucks for stuff. You know, think about it. You can buy a case of water at Sam's or Walmart for, what, $4 maybe, something like that, the Sam's Choice or whatever. Um, what's investing, uh, let's say if you want to get yeah. 10 cases of water to stick on hand, what's investing 40 bucks for your potential livelihood if you can't have water for a few weeks? I mean, it's crazy not to do that, not to have some water in hand if you have the room. Do it. That's one thing people don't think about often is, you know what, you know, I always get water. I just turn on the faucet or something. Well, guess what? It's not always the case. We just came out of our boil water order uh yesterday i think it's monday yeah yesterday they, they lifted the order and there were people in my neighborhood that didn't have any water they didn't have the power to to, to boil it um and they didn't have any bottled water on at home i mean anyway cheap investment for water buy a like 10 cases of water i i usually try to keep anywhere between six and eight cases of water on hand uh, I'd like to keep 10, but mine is a space consideration. Uh, but my wife, I think, is starting to see the, the validity of having water on hand for emergencies like this. So maybe I'll be able to talk into taking up some more space in one of the closets or something for some water. Non-perishable food. You don't have to go out and get MREs and stuff like this. You know, they're expensive. Freeze-dried meals, they're expensive. They're great because they last forever. But guess what? It takes water to activate those, and you have to have a heat source to really enjoy it. But, you know, with that said, yeah, I've got some freeze-dried meals, but a lot of my staples are in canned goods. You know, you can go to Sam's and get a case of chicken noodle soup for like eight or nine bucks for 12 cans. You know, the same concept. Buy you some high-protein foods, canned goods like beans and soups and whatnot, and keep them on hand. You know, keep them somewhere in a cool, dry place. Keep them on hand for emergencies because you never, you never know. Uh, and, and another thing is on those canned goods, you know, they always had that nowadays they have a best buy date on canned goods. You know, I'm not saying do this at your own risk, but everybody knows you can eat them past those best buy dates. Someone tell my wife that, please. But canned goods, the number one thing for canned goods is 
smell it. When you open it, smell it. If it doesn't smell right, don't eat it. But anyway, again, so what I'm saying is for as far as the food and water front, you know, a, a guy can go out or, or a lady or a, a family, however you want to refer to it, could go out and spend 150 bucks and have preparations of food for their family for a couple of weeks. It's just a matter of getting off your butt and going out there and doing it. So let me tell you, don't, don't delay because every once in a while, mother nature likes to flex her muscles at us. And she did it in Texas last week. She could do it somewhere else next week. It could be in the form of a tornado, it could be in the form of an earthquake, it could be in the form of a hurricane. Who knows what she's going to throw at us, but you never freaking know. And not to mention mother nature, you know, we always have the bad nature types in the world that can cause, you know, some sort of catastrophe. So that's what basically I wanted to do in this video is just to let you know, you know what, hey, it sucks not to be without power, it sucks not to be without to be without water, uh, you know, but hey, you can get past it if you are prepared. And, and preparation to me is the same as that old adage, you know, an ounce of prevention sure does defeat a pound of cure <laughs> further down the road. So, I hope everybody that watches my videos, I know I know there's at least two or three of you guys that watch them pretty pretty regularly. So I hope you guys haven't been impacted too bad by this this storm. I hope we've learned some lessons from it. I know I've learned a few things, uh, a few tweaks on preps I need to do around the house. And there are plenty of other subjects besides water and food, but those are the two things you got to have, water and food. Other tidbits I can throw out here from the last week, always have batteries on hand. Always have some electric lanterns on hand for those batteries. Those little Yuko candle lanterns, you guys see my video on, I'm sure. If not, this is what they look like. They're little Yuko candle lanterns, like a single one and a triple one. Those things are awesome when the power is out, and especially when it's cold and the heat is out, because those actually put a little bit of heat into the air. Now, it's only a candle, but when it heats up those little metal reflectors on top, it does help. You can tell a difference. I can vouch for sure and say you can tell a difference when you have one or two of those burning in the room you're in and your, your power is out and it's cold outside. Those are a great item to have. Just regular candles are great. Make sure one thing I didn't have, I had a whole box of emergency candles I bought at Ikea of all places, good candles. I didn't have a single candle holder around the house that holds the tapered candlesticks. Something I never thought of. <laughs> and I had this whole box of candles, which the only way I could use them was to try to melt the wax and stick it on a plate or something. And that works okay, but it's a lot safer if you get some type of a holder to put them in. Have all that stuff together in one spot. You know, when when our electricity went out, you know, I have camping lanterns and flashlights scattered all over the place. So, of course, it was easy for me to find one. But I'm going to tell you, from moving forward, I'm going to keep all that in a centralized location. Get me a big plastic storage bin and have all my lanterns and extra lanterns and flashlights in that storage bin. Little things like that are things you can do to make it easier on yourself when, when these preps come. So... I'm sure there's plenty more, but I've rambled enough for this video. I'm probably close to the 20-minute mark, if not over, and I don't want to continue to sit here and bore y'all. So again, I hope y'all are safe. Uh, you know, take some of, some of my advice on this. You know, keep keep some gas on hand if you have a generator. If you don't have a generator, get you a generator. It don't have to be a fancy one. Hell, you can go out and find a used open frame construction generator, probably for a couple hundred bucks or trade for it or whatever. Have a generator on hand. Get you some water on hand. Have some cases of water. That should be the, the amount should be dependent upon how many people you have living at your home. Uh, and get you some non-perishable foods to have around as well. And last tip: if you have canned goods, make sure you have a can opener that is a manual can opener. Everybody's got a Swiss Army knife or whatever. I say, oh, I can open the cans with this. Well, you know what, you can, but. Go to Amazon or wherever, spend you about seven or eight bucks and get you a swing away manual can opener. Because you know those electric can openers, they're great, but when your electricity is down and you're not running your generator, <laughs> they don't work. <laughs> All right, y'all, be safe out there. Thanks for watching this video. And as always, please like, comment, and subscribe.
We'll speak to you soon.